Hello, and welcome to the Christian Habits Podcast. This is the podcast that will help you break free from your strongholds, draw closer to God, and develop habits that will help you love God and others better. And now, here's your host, Barb Raveling. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad to have all you guys here today, and I'm excited about the person I'm interviewing today, John Mark Comer. John Mark Comer is the New York Times bestselling author of seven books, including The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry and Live No Lies, as well as being a pastor, teacher, and founder of Practicing the Way. His latest book, which I read and loved, is Practicing the Way, Be With Jesus, Become Like Him, Do As He Did. After serving as the lead pastor of the Bridgetown Church in Portland, Oregon for nearly two decades, John Mark and his family now reside in Los Angeles, where he serves as a teacher in residence on discipleship and spiritual formation at Vintage Church LA. His podcast, John Mark Comer Teachings and Rule of Life, have been ranked on top religion and spirituality podcast charts in the U.S. and U.K. Welcome to the podcast, John Mark. Great to be with you. Thank you so much. Well, good. Well, in in the book, he talks about being with Jesus, becoming like him and doing as he did. And he he uses the word uh, apprentice rather than disciple when he talks about being with Jesus. So why do you use that word, John Mark? Two reasons. Um, One, because a number of scholars who are much smarter than me think it's a better translation of the Greek word Mathetes, which is normally translated disciple. The word literally means a learner or a student, but it wasn't a modern Western model of education where you go to class and sit through a lecture and take notes. It was an ancient holistic apprenticeship model of education where you follow a rabbi and you're with him all of the time and you learn from him, not just how to think, but how to live. And then the sex so one, I just think it's a better English translation of what it means to be a follower or disciple or apprentice of Jesus. And two, because I think disciple isn't really a word that is used a lot in the wider culture. So it's easy to accidentally import meanings into the word that are not there in Jesus' mind or Jesus' first century world. And so a lot of people talk about discipleship and what they mean is one-on-one mentorship or leadership development and all good things. But I don't think that's what the New Testament writers mean by discipleship, which is a whole life process of being with Rabbi Jesus for the purpose of becoming like Jesus with the end goal of becoming the kind of person who just naturally and genuinely out of your transform inner person says and does the kinds of thing that Jesus said and did. So apprenticeship, I think, is a great mental model or metaphor for what it means to follow after Jesus. Okay. And then you also talk a little bit about the difference between a a Christian and an apprentice of Jesus. So what would you say about that? Yeah, well, I mean, we're into semantics here, right? But the word Christian, as most Christians know, is barely ever used in the New Testament. Two or three times, it's only used in a negative way in the New Testament. It was an insult or really like a religious slur used by pagans against followers of Christ. They called them Christians or, you know, little Christs or wannabe Christ or wannabe, you know, mini messiahs, wannabe Jesus people. And it was an insult. And over time, after the writing of the New Testament, followers of Jesus began to pick up this slur and kind of self-identify and says, yes, and say, yes, we are Christians. We are little Christ. We do want to be like Jesus. And, you know, that's, that's beautiful. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that at all. But the word dis- so Christian is only used two or three times in the New Testament. Disciple is used, I believe, 268 times in the New Testament, meaning it's the dominant kind of uh, rubric, this idea of an apprentice of Jesus. This word is used 268 times. It's the dominant way that followers of Jesus self-identify. It's the kind of mental model by which they make sense of their life with Jesus. 
And in the modern world, we still have these two words, Christian and disciple or apprentice. And many people in the world today self-identify as Christians. You know, in America, for all of the talk about how America is post-Christian, and I now live in LA, I spent the last 20 years in Portland, Oregon. I grew up in the Bay Area. I've spent my whole life in very secular parts of the country where it's not 68%, it's more like 1% or 2% of the population is a Christian. But in the, the nation as a whole, and I'm sure there are people listening from Europe and other parts of the world that are even more secular, but still 68% of people self-identify as Christians. But a number of independent surveys, and it's really tricky to measure a person's devotion to Jesus, but a number of independent surveys estimate that about 4% of Americans are following Jesus or apprenticing under Jesus. Mm -hmm. That is a staggering disparity. And I don't say that to like throw shame on anyone, just to name the problem, the crisis of discipleship that we are living through in the Western, or at least the American church. And in the modern world, all a Christian really means is someone who basically at a mental level, agrees with the basic constituents of kind of Christianity, a word not used by Jesus or the New Testament writers for a world religion based on the, the life and teachings of Jesus, and um, maybe or maybe not goes to church from time to time, and does not necessarily mean somebody whose entire life is organized around the three goals of being with Jesus for the purpose of becoming like Jesus in order to do what he did. That, that is not what the word Christian means in our wider culture. And so, you know, many of my Catholic brothers and sisters, I'm not Catholic, but many in that tradition of the church uh, like to distinguish between a Catholic and a practicing Catholic. Mm -hmm. You know, the former just, a Catholic may just mean you're from Boston or the South Side or you're from Italy Whereas a practicing Catholic is a measure of devotion to Jesus. And there are practices like daily mass and prayer and a heart, you know, the rosary, but then there's the heart of devotion to Jesus. And I think the time has come for at least American Christians to distinguish between a Christian and practicing Christian. Again, not to throw shame on anyone, but to invite people to not just believe in God and basic Christian doctrine and attend church from time to time, but to invite people to apprentice under Jesus in the whole of their life. Okay. Well, that I, I think that's really interesting. And I think a lot of people want to be closer to God and they don't always know how. And so what do you think a practicing Christian would look like? Hmm. Well, first off, I think they would live a very relational life in community with other practicing followers of Jesus that mm -hmm. would become like family for them. And they would blur the lines between family based on blood and family based on discipleship to Jesus, what in some parts of the South and other cultures they call kin you know, a kind mm. of family that aren't biological, but are family. And I think they would live in kinship. They would live in a deeply relational life with other followers of Jesus. Secondly, I think they would live deeply counter to the culture. What I, uh, in one of my previous books, call a, a counter counterculture, because the way of Jesus is not a counterculture in the sense of rebellion or angst or anger, or tear down, but it is almost like a counter counterculture. And uh, I think they would live radically different than the host culture of the United States of America in issues of materialism and issues of uh, they would live simply and generous. They would live deeply content. They would live relationally in a, and commun you know, if not communally, at least in community in an age of mm -hmm. radical individualism, they would integrate to their bodies and their gender. They would channel their sexuality toward God and God ordained, you know, conduits for sexuality and not, and not um, spread it freely around the world as is much common in our culture. They would speak in a way that is gentler and kinder and purer and not in the crassness 
and the derogatory way of our culture. They would value relationships across race and class. Now, some of this is aspirational. All of us fall wildly short of this vision. But the point is, they would live very differently than the host culture. And then thirdly, I think they would arrange their life around a set of practices, um, also known as spiritual disciplines, or habits and rhythms and just plain speak that slow their life down from the chronic hurry and busyness and digital distraction of the wider culture and enable them to really focus on a life of depth with God and really pay attention to God in prayer and really have spaces both alone and in kind of contemplative spaces and in deep relationships with other people where they're really able to open up deeper and deeper parts of their brokenness to Jesus for his healing. So I think it's those three things, a deeply relational life, a deeply counter countercultural life, and a, a slowed down life that's arranged around practices that put life with Jesus and transformation to become like Jesus at the center of all they say and do. Okay. Yeah. That sounds interesting. I think you talk about like maybe a rule of life or something like that. Yes. That you have, yes. was that what that third one was about? Yeah, so the way you do that is through um, a, a way of life that ancient, ancient ancient Christians called a rule of life. Now, that is not modern language. Um, there are some streams of the church where that language is still alive, but it's not common. Not in the I never was never familiar with that language for many years in the church. It's ancient language, and it's important to note that ancient Christians called it a rule of life, not rules for life. So first off, a rule of life is not a list of rules. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's a rule. Uh, the Latin word is, comes from about the third century, was regula. And in the ancient Mediterranean, kind of near the end of the Roman Empire, that word regula, which literally means um, a straight piece of wood. So we get words from it like regular or uh, regulation or rule all come from this straight piece of wood. And it was used to measure, it was used, you know, for economics. But a lot of scholars think this word regula, straight piece of wood, was also used for the trellis in an ancient winery or vineyard. And if you go, ever been to a winery? Is there a winery anywhere near where you're at? Far <laughs> no, in the world? Any, I don't, I don't any good wine country? I'm in Utah. And no, uh, I don't no think there's wine any wineries here. <laughs> okay, you said yeah. you were in Astoria a while before. There's there's one oh, country yeah. in yeah, Oregon. I keep moving. Yeah. yeah, there is an Astoria. Yes. <laughs> yes. So you've been to a winery, I'm sure. And underneath every vine is the trellis. There's this kind of wooden support structure built underneath it to lift it up off the ground away from dangerous animals and disease and damage from people stepping on it and kind of index it toward the sun in order for it to grow and bear the maximum amount of fruit. So early Christians took Jesus' teaching in John chapter 15 very seriously, where Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. And they said, okay, so we need to abide in Jesus to live in, make our home in, dwell in Jesus in order to bear much fruit, become you know the fruit of love and joy and peace of Christlikeness. And in order to do that, just like a vine, we need a trellis. We need a regula. We need a rule of life. So a rule of life, this is my definition. A rule of life is a schedule and a set of practices and relational rhythms that organize our life around the three goals of an apprentice, to be with Jesus, to become like him, and to do as he did. And enable us to live enables us to live in alignment with our deepest desires. So that's what it is. It's basically a schedule. It's a set of practices and relational rhythms that make the center of our life abiding in Jesus. So, could you give us an example of what that looks like on a practical way? I know you talked about uh, you referred sometime in the book, but I don't know if you talked about it. That your own personal prayer rhythm is that what you're talking about, or is it more than that? Yes. No, it's, it's okay. There's not a right way to do rule of life and there's no one size fits all approach, but yes, there are some keystone habits or practices in my rule. For example, every morning for me, first thing, and I don't think everybody needs to do this, but I need to do this. 
first thing after I wake, I go into this little room in our basement where it's really quiet and there's no distraction. And I spend one hour in quiet silence and prayer, praying the Psalms before God, before I ever touch my phone, before I'm allowed to even check a text message. And uh, that's self. Uh, that I chose that. There's nobody put that on me. There's no legalism there. I don't feel guilty if I don't do it. That's my way of beginning every day by opening my consciousness to the love of God. Another keystone habit for me would be the practice of Sabbath. So we take a full 24 hours every weekend. We power off all of our devices. We gather around the Sabbath kind of dinner table with family and friend with our kinship group. And we throw this giant celebration and do gratitude and, and spend time together and sleep and rest and play games. Like that's just central to my life with God. And so it's practices and relational touch points like that. Um, meeting with a close friend to confess sin and unburden, you know, stuff every other week. Like these are just kind of things that are in my calendar. I can point to them and say, Hey, this is there. And uh, it for mine, because I have such a holistic view of discipleship and of the human person, it would include things like, you know, getting exercise five or six days a week and trying to sleep eight hours a night uh, because exhausted, stressed out people are rarely loving, patient, peaceful, kind people. And I want to be all of that. And so <laughs> I need to, you know, go do some cardio and get a good night's sleep and drink plenty of water and begin my day in prayer and live deeply relational life and live with no secrets and let people into my struggles and temptations. So it's arranging my life very intentionally. A lot of that is stuff that a lot of people will kind of sort of do, but very haphazardly. It wouldn't be the practice of Sabbath. It'd be when they get really tired, they might take a day off and just chill for a morning. And, you know, they might have some close friends they call up when they're really in a pinch. So it's just kind of bringing more intentionality. A lot of people are so much more intentional, have such a clear plan for their job or their career or their exercise routine or their physical health or their children's soccer career, or educational grades. Mm -hmm. They have way more of a plan for that than they do for their spiritual formation. And ironically, right. we often just kind of wing it when it comes to our relationship with God and our transformation into people who are like God, when we're highly intentional about our work or our investments or retirement or our children. So I think, you know, we need to balance that out and bring even more passion and hunger and intensity and, and patience to our apprenticeship to Jesus. Yeah, I love that. And I so agree with you. And you talk in the book, you, you know, you tell your, your, some of your little things that you do, but you also mention, you know, people who are different and if they have more kids around. So, so if you guys get the book, you'll find other things in there too. So I love how. Yes. I'm not just, just giving you a list of disciplines that you need to do and become more right. of an introvert, not remotely what the book is about. <laughs> but it's helpful to see how other people do things. And yes. and I can see how those intentional practices can help. And uh, one of the th things I really loved about your book is you talked about spending time with Jesus. And I think you said something about contemplation. I wrote mm. it down somewhere. Do you remember what you said about, I think it was like looking at Jesus, looking at you or something like that. I yes. do remember because I read the book like, I don't know, a month or so ago. And I remember practicing that and I've been forgetting about it, but I loved it. So maybe can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, I mean, part of what I'm calling people to, it's not a book on contemplative prayer, but I'm, I'm calling people to a more contemplative, slower, you know, less hurried way of life that really puts prayer and life with Jesus and community at the center and not on the margins. And the word contemplation comes from the New Testament itself. It's used by the writer Paul. Uh, one of the most famous examples is 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. We all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory or beauty um, are transformed into the same image, you know, from glory to greater glory. Beautiful line about contemplative prayer and its effect to transform us into people who are like what we look at in God. And so, yes, I define contemplative prayer as looking at God, looking at you in love. 
And I tell this story that I found from Marjorie Thompson, who's a, a Presbyterian retreat leader, spiritual director. She tells this beautiful story uh, about a set in Europe, I think in the 19th or 18th century, about an elderly peasant who would come into this chapel or this church building every day and would just sit for hours in the quiet by himself. And one day the priest came up to him and said, what, what are you doing here for hours every day? And the elderly man just said, I look at him, he looks at me, and we are happy. <laughs> and I just thought I that, that that's contemplative prayer. That That's it right there. Right. And, you know, we haven't even gotten into, uh, there's so much in the book also on becoming like God. We haven't talked about that. Uh, so, you know, I, I talk, I mean, any of you guys who are listening know I talk about the renewing of the mind, but. Uh, John Mark talks about um, just when you, I mean, there's all kinds of things you talk about, so we won't, I'll let everybody get the book and, and read that. But I would think if you're always aware of God's presence, if you're in such close fellowship with him too, that is one way I think to help with your habits and all those things, because you're in his fellowship and then you're not tempted as much to, I don't know, give into temptation. I don't know. Do you think that works that way? I think there is a direct reciprocal re relationship between our level of joy in God and the power that sin has in our life. Meaning the more overjoyed we are to be with and around God, the less tempting sin is. If you're in a marriage, the more, the more in love I am with my wife, the more I'm with her and want to be with her and enjoy her and I'm satisfied in my marriage, the less tempted I am to have an affair or look at pornography or whatever. And it doesn't mean that the tempt temptation is non-existent, but it has no power over me. Where often when people are deeply unhappy in a marriage, it makes that temptation feel like a black hole of gravitational weight, you know? And the same is true in our relationship to God. So one way to fight sin is not by fighting sin at all. It's by finding deep joy in Jesus. Just like one way to fight off having an affair is just to date your spouse and celebrate each other and do gratitude practices and have a daily touch point and go on romantic getaways. That's one great way to avoid, you know, sin or adultery or infidelity or divorce. And so in the same way with Jesus, I think to the degree that we are finding great joy and life and peace and contentment in God is the degree to which we are free of the draw, the gravitational pull of the world. And that's where the role of practices and disciplines and habits and a rule of life all comes after that. So that's all how we try to stay in love with Jesus, if that makes sense. So I go on a date night, most weeks, every Wednesday night with my lovely wife. And there's a discipline to that because there are some weeks when I'm tired or you know, I had a stressful work day and I'd rather just hang home and watch The Crown or whatever. But there's a discipline to it, but I don't do it out of guilt or shame or if I, you know, I'm a bad husband if I don't, you know, go on a weekly date with my wife. I do it because I want a healthy relationship with her. And I know that takes time. It takes, it takes you know, really carving out distraction-free moments. It's not quick. It takes, you know, time. We need more than just our daily touch point. We have three teenagers. We need like a couple hours away from them where we can just be together and talk and connect and process the, the journey of life. And in a very similar way with God, there are disciplines, but they're all there to just, they're the trellis, not the vine, right? They're there just, they're the date night, not the marriage. They're there just mm -hmm. to undergird love. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I mean, think of a, was it Daniel that was praying three times a day, met God three times a day? I mean, that's one example of a yes. little trellis. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, where can people find you online, John Mark? Yeah. Well, the book is called Practicing the Way, but it's also uh, shares the name with a new nonprofit that I've recently started, also called Practicing the Way. So you can go to practicingtheway.org. You can find more about the book. We have an upcoming course to go along with the book and a bunch of free resources, teachings, podcasts. And then I also have a website, just johnmarkcomer.com. You can find more books, podcasts, teachings, all of that available for free. 
Okie dokie. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast, John Mark. We really appreciate having you here. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay. And thank you everybody for tuning in. It was great to have all of you here. Hope you have a good week and I will talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Christian Habits Podcast. If you'd like more help with stopping and starting habits, check out Barb's blog at www.barbraveling.com.